सहना सहनो भुनक्तु सह वीर करवाहे तेजस्वी तमस्तु मावेषावे ओम शांति 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 नमस्कार धन्यवाद थैंक यू सो मच फ्रेंड्स इट्स ग्रेट प्लेजर टू वेलकम यू ऑल टू दुडेज एडिशन ऑफ विमर्श सीरीज ऑफ लेक्चर्स एंड डॉक्टर शैलेश नायक विल डिलीवर दैट लेक्चर टुडे एंड आई एम मोस्ट ग्रेटफुल टू हिम फॉर बीइंग विद अस टुडे ही हैज टेकन टाइम ऑफ फ्रॉम हिज बिजी शेड्यूल एंड आई वांट टू थैंक हिम फॉर दैट वी लुक फॉरवर्ड टू हिज टॉक i would like to uh, introduce uh, our distinguished uh, speaker uh, dr shalek naik uh, is the director uh, national institute of advanced studies bangalore chancellor terry institute of advanced studies new delhi and uh, editor in chief journal of indian society of remote sensing uh, he obtained his phd in geology from uh, ms university of baroda in 1980 he was the secretary ministry of earth sciences and chair earth system science organization during 2008 to 2015 he set up the state of the art tsunami warning system for the indian ocean and developed marine services during his tenure in the uh, earth system science organization he had joined uh, isro in 1978 and pioneered applications of remote sensing to coastal and marine environments and developed products for coastal management and services for fishery and ocean state forecast he is fellow of the indian academy of sciences indian national science academy national academy of sciences india the international society of photogrammetry and remote sensing and academician of the international academy of aeronautics he was confirmed the isc vikram sarabhai memorial award in 2012 he has published about 200 papers in various uh, scientific uh, journals uh as you know uh, as i said he was the secretary in the uh, ministry of earth sciences uh, uh, briefly uh, the uh, government of india had created a department of ocean development uh, in the cabinet secretariat under the charge of prime minister in 1981 in 2006 this became the separate ministry called the ministry of ocean development and later uh, it uh, also reorganized into the ministry of earth sciences when various institutions uh, were merged together the indian meteorological department indian institute of tropical meteorology and the national center for medium range weather forecasting etc they all come together and there is also an earth commission just like the atomic energy commission and space commission was also set up so i think the topic that he is going to speak today on is of great importance uh in view of the uh, huge focus on climate change and its impact on the mankind uh on uh, policy it's also a geopolitical issue uh obviously there is a, a great deal of curiosity as to what is happening uh, what is this climate change all about uh, and how is it impacting this uh, earth and the planetary systems for all this we need observation we need uh, measurement we need science we need uh, theories and we need an interdisciplinary approach to understanding uh, the planetary systems and uh, we live in this earth on this planet and this is a very bhagwan jaise kehte hai na bhagwan has given this fantastic uh, earth to us on which we are living but uh, it is not that simple there are any number of uh, very important uh, planetary systems which are interacting with each other with land with oceans uh, atmospheres and several uh, 
uh, you know uh, manifestations uh, in the of in, uh, the interaction of these systems and that manifestation of that interaction is what makes life uh, possible and today all of this is being uh, has been disturbed and climate change is uh, one uh, uh, aspect of it there is also this uh, talk uh, among the scientific circles about uh, the planetary boundaries essentially the safe space which the humans have space zone in which the humans should uh, uh, work and without disturbing the planet itself but uh, the co2 emissions uh, has uh, the uh, you know disturbed uh, the planetary system and we do not know what is going to happen in the future but to understand all this as i said uh, we need uh, uh, a observations and earth sciences which includes a number of disciplines are so very important uh, india is highly vulnerable to uh, the climate uh, change that is taking place and we are seeing the evidence of it uh, every single day in this context i think uh, the work being done in india uh, in the field of earth sciences whether it is academic work or technological uh, work or even policy in the policy uh, uh, space all this is very important but very few of us really understand this we are of course uh, exposed to the headlines uh, now and then and uh, when some extreme weather event takes place and then we forget about it so we thought that uh, uh, we will request uh, dr shailesh naik uh, who has headed the uh, ministry of earth sciences who himself is a uh, geologist of repute and as i read out vast experience uh, in the uh, understanding of uh, the oceans the, the coastal systems and uh, related uh, uh, disciplines i thought that uh, we request him to uh, explain to us in a simple manner as to what is the state of uh, earth sciences uh, studies in india why do we study it how much resources are we uh, spending on this and what are the future directions of our research how has it been uh, useful and of course anything else that you would uh, like to talk about so uh, thank you shailesh ji for uh, uh, being with us today and we look forward to uh, your uh, talk because uh, what you say is uh, important from our point of view from our point of view from the vif point of view also because we do study uh, climate change we do study some uh, Uh, the policy aspects of science and technology uh, and uh, the social aspects of science and technology so what you say will is uh, uh, will add to our uh, understanding and also help us understand uh, the complicated issues uh, better so uh, thank you very much and uh, i now request you to speak perhaps for about 45 minutes or so and uh, we can then have uh, uh, a question and answer session and this is an open session so many people uh, are uh, uh, listening to you and we would also uh, you are also being broadcast on our uh, youtube uh, channel as well and uh, after you speak we will also put you the your talk on uh, our uh, website as well so shailesh ji thank you thank you dr gupta it's a really pleasure uh, to give a talk at uh, vivekanand international and uh, I'm looking forward to very fruitful discussion. I'm very happy that uh, General Sani, Dr. Karthikeyan, and many other distinguished uh, people have come to listen to this talk. So I am extremely happy. And what I'm trying to do is exactly what you said: is some of the uh, work which we have been doing in the earth science and the various institute, how this is useful to the country, and uh, where we stand as far as the internationally is concerned now the first thing is the most important uh, that what should be our agenda and uh, we had uh, fixed the three main things uh, one that we need to address some of the issues the related to discovery of the new perspective what are the science questions in the earth science exploration of the terrain exploration of the sea and what is the earth system role vis a vis the society so this is the one which is very important aspect that the focus on the discovery second is the understanding of various processes which happens 
between the different components, like between atmosphere and ocean, or ocean and the snow and ice. So, plus the this process is occur at various scales, various uh, time scales at the space scales. So that is one. And what are the consequences of these interactions on the human being, as well as how the human system and the Earth system is interacting, like what Dr. Gupta has said about uh, the climate change, is trying to understand that how the anthropogenic activities has affected the Earth system, and the in turn, the how the Earth system will affect the uh, the our activities. Now, all this knowledge which is being generated, the most important aspect is we would like this knowledge to be converted into products, services for the public good. So the main purpose is that we start with the what is required for the public good. And then to provide that, we go back and try to build models, observations, and many other things. So it is not the, we want to do science and then we find some applications, but we know that what is required and then we go backwards for the creating the science. And so this is the basic uh, philosophy with which uh, we work. Now, just to give you a very brief idea is this process, you know, the earth uh, is a single system and a self-regulating system, which has a hydrosphere, which has atmosphere, geosphere, biosphere, and cryosphere of snow and ice. And there is a lot of interaction. I'm not going to explain all these interactions, but there is a lot of transfer between the energy and the mass from one system to the other system, as well as within that system. Now, this exchange, which uh, occurs of the mass and the material, actually governs the entire Earth system or a climate system on the Earth. And the human activities, as we have seen, that started affecting this system considerably. And because of that, we have some of the other issues which also came into picture. So this is the basic uh, idea, and we try to observe these processes through various means, in situ, satellite, aircraft. Uh, then we try to model them, and then we try to pro give, make the forecast system for various aspects. So this is the basic thing on which we work. Now, I have picked a few areas which is, I think, very important for us. The one is the hazards. I think the two major uh, challenges which we have in this century is one, the hazard, other is the climate change. Now, as you know, that the cyclones, uh, especially on the East Coast, and now also on the West Coast, is very critical, and it comes regularly every year, and it is very important for us to understand that where it is being formed, how it is moving, and what is its intensity or the strength, and what likely to happen. Now, this is, as you most of you know, over the years, we have now done extremely good, built an extremely good forecast system, which includes a large amount of the different satellite data, as well as the ocean observations, as well as the land, atmosphere observation, land observations. And now, our forecast has come to a level which is almost uh, what best can be achieved is around 40 kilometers of a landfall. And this is consistently we are doing. It's not that it is happening for a time. If you see in 1999, 20 years ago, we lost almost 10,000 people through the cyclone. And now if you see the loss of life have been drastically minimized. And this is Almost, uh, it is not only because of the forecast, but there are two more things which has happened, that the, the forecast, the trust of the local administration, the state government, the national government, has now tremendous faith in our own forecast. And the second thing is the people also now believes the forecast. So based on our forecast, the people are ready to, I mean, we have been evacuated in Orissa, almost 2 million people and the life lost was almost around 12, which is 
considerable low than what we used to. So this is the first thing uh, which is, I think in my view, it's extremely important. And this is not only for the India, but the all countries in the Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal are provided this input free of cost as a regional center, <coughs> regional center of the WMO. So we are providing all these inputs, but we are not uh, stopping. The, our research is continuing to further improve upon this forecast. We can still improve our intensity forecast. And uh, so this is the continuous process. And also we are now trying to understand about the thermal, uh, thunderstorms, Western disturbance, and all other aspects which is also being done. So this is one uh, major application. Second, which is uh, uh, very uh, after the 2004 tsunami, where we were uh, having absolutely no idea that what most people even don't know what was the tsunami. And uh, India has built one of the best system in the world. And this is the first time we build a location specific services. That means we are providing every 50 kilometer of forecast for entire Indian Ocean. So there are 1800 points we provide the forecast and both the run up height as well as the travel time we provide. And this was a huge improvement at that particular time with the US and Japan was giving those who will be following, they were giving the basin wide forecast. That means Bay of Bengal will have a tsunami or Arabian Sea will have a tsunami. Now that cannot work in our country because you can't evacuate people all along the Bay of Bengal. So this system has been working for last 14 years now, and we did not have a single failure. I mean, the false forecast up till now. And we were the first to use the simulated model forecast. And this system, the first time has been completely automated. That means right from the detection of earthquake, sea level changes, giving forecast, and providing this to all 22 countries in the Indian Ocean without any human intervention. The first forecast goes without any human intervention. And this is something which is completely new innovation where at that particular time, and uh, many other countries now has been uh, following this. So this is something which has been done, which is, uh, a state of the art and even even today the indian tsunami warning system is taken as an example how the tsunami warning system should have worked so this is another major thing but of course you may be knowing that there are still some issues especially when the earthquake is a very large especially above the 8.5 uh, magnitude what happened in japan uh, initially we tend to estimate underestimate them and that time it was estimated 7.9 and accordingly you give a warning now actually the it was 9.1 but when you want to do very fast this underestimation has come so we are now trying to use the gps and gnss data to find out the rupture and based on the rupture we can go back and have a magnitude so that this can be avoided also the landslides due to the submarine uh, landslides or a volcano a near field tsunami there are certain challenges and we have been now addressing those challenges that how best we can address them the earthquake is the another major issue and uh, especially in himalaya because of the northward thrust of the indian plate uh, there is a lot of stress has been built up and the gps measurement have said that this is a large amount of stress has developed. And what you see is the central seismic gap. That is an area where the large earthquake is expected. Of course, we don't expect that the earthquake would be mega earthquake like uh, 8.5 or 9 or something, but there could be an earthquake in this region. So earthquakes, we are not able to forecast. But we can definitely understand and the, we can be prepared for an earthquake. So 
what we need to do is once you identify the areas which are likely to be vulnerable, I think the school, colleges and public building has to be retrofitted and made earthquake proof. That is, I think, the first thing which is required. Uh, parallelly, uh, we are trying to understand the complete structure and composition of the Indian lithosphere, especially below the Himalaya. So we need a, we, we have built up a good network of GPS, GNSS. So we need how the changes are taking place. We are going to have a SAR interferometry. We will find where the strain is building. What is the different uh, structure and composition from gravity and magnetic data? So these are the things which we have now taken up to understand the entire uh, structure and composition of the lithosphere, which will give us some idea about the earthquake. So till we build something, a prediction model, I think the earthquake generation processes we need to understand and that is where we are once we have this understanding we will go to the next level but there are also the other kind of earthquakes which is going to take place uh, is what we call as a triggered earthquake now a lot of our engineering activities uh, maybe reservoir or a large scale and a deep surface or deep mining the fracking of hydrocarbons, of course, in India we don't do, but in US this is very common, or large underground explosions, they can also generate a earthquake. And many areas uh, are getting, a, these earthquakes are not very large, it may be very small, but it generates a panic in the surrounding regions, like what happens in the Palgar or in Saurashtra, where certain times people get these shocks and they get uh, why this is happening. Now, in Koina, uh, 1967, this earthquake took place, and we are now reasonably sure that this has happened because of the reservoir impounding. And India has now launched a very major experiment in uh, Koina, where we have drilled a borehole up to three kilometers and gone right up to where the earthquakes are occurring. And we have put the instruments to measure what happens during before and after the earthquakes, what kind of physical chemical changes are occurring. Actually, we have a lot of information now into this. And this we are trying to use to understand that what is likely to happen. The, what we now know is that the strength of the rock is not sufficient to hold a very large. So we don't expect any large earthquake to happen in this region. But every year, there is an earthquake which is could be of three, four, five magnitude is still occurring in this region. Now, this is this project is of course a long-term project. So we have drilled up to three kilometers. The next level, we are going up to seven kilometer where exactly the earthquakes are occurring, and we'll measure all this. And then based on this information, we would be able to model and get some idea about the triggered earthquakes. And I must say this will be the first time in the world if we can uh, provide this because of course it's not that other countries have not tried the usa has drilled this similar kind of a borehole but the earthquake is not occurring where the borehole is well here we are pretty sure that earthquake will occur where exactly is the borehole because this is long i mean quite a large experiment i can't explain everything but we are uh, the initial results are extremely good and we will now move to drill seven kilometers and I must say that this was drilling and everything completely done indigenously. We have not taken anybody's help. So our idea is also at the same time to build our own technology to understand the science and also to provide the knowledge, not only for India, but the global community as a whole. Of course, this is a very recent uh, Uttarakhand Rishiganga floods, which the huge chunk of ice just uh, I mean, landslide, you can say, or avalanche, whatever. Uh, there are different opinions, but it came and it fall right from 5,600 meter to 3,800 3, meter altitude. It's a huge mass and which created a lot of issues. And But the important thing is that this area started developing certain fractures uh, even earlier. And this was... There is no mechanism of monitoring such things. So 
we were not able to do. But now I think there is a very much desirable to set up a monitoring system where any minor change is happening, which we can definitely record through satellite data, and then try to understand that to such kind of a, uh, hazard or calamity. And there is another thing, uh, which is, I will come back when we discuss about the snow and ice. There are many other things happening in this region, which also can contribute to this kind of thing. Next, we will go quickly to weather and climate. And of course, in India, the monsoon is the most important aspect. And a uh, few years, 10 years back, uh, the skill which we had of the prediction was about 0.4. And then we have launched a monsoon mission uh, with idea that we should be able to increase our skill to about 0.6.5, which is the internationally recognized as a potential limit. And uh, of course, we initial modeling framework we borrowed from US and then this has been modified. And now the high resolution model, which for seasonal prediction has been in place. We are now giving forecast using this uh, with a scale of 0.71. And this is uh, first time this kind of uh, high skill has been achieved. And now WMO has recognized our Institute, Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology as a global center for monsoon research. And India is doing pretty well. We have now extended range production, seasonal, and the short range production. Uh, those who may be following uh, IMD forecast would have seen in Delhi that the forecast has dramatically improved over a period of time. And we are, but we are continuing with the further research and uh, uh, we would definitely like to further improve our forecast because it is still not 100%. So uh, there are possibility that sometimes the forecast may be not be right, but there is a continuous effort going on to further improve upon that. And the, one of the main application of this is to provide a, what we call as a agromet advisories to the farmers and where it, they have been provided with the rainfall, maximum, minimum temperature, total crowd cover, humidity, and the wind related information to twice a week at a district level to all the people. And this has found to be very useful to the farmers. And today about 40 million farmers have been using through variety of farm operation, when to do plowing or sowing or irrigation, fertilizer, pesticide applications, what kind of uh, variety to be used, how, whether storage should be done of harvest outside or inside, and many other such things which is now being used. And this service, uh, we have asked uh, National Council of Applied Economic Research that what is the benefit coming out of this service? And they estimated that the annual benefit is about 10,000 crore. So which is, you know, almost five times of the Ministry of Earth Science budget. So the the information is provided free of cost, but it brings tremendous enough amount of benefit to the farmers and ultimately to the country. Now, also we try to understand the monsoon, which is very critical. So how monsoon started, what, how it originated and what was its trend? So we did a very major experiment to understand this in the Arabian Sea. So the sediments which comes from Himalaya uh, give you idea that what kind of uh, monsoon it was, what is the role of Himalaya in the monsoon. And this kind of uh, study is done. 2015, we did this uh, experiment. And now the results have been coming out. There are several results, actually. There are 24 main experiments were done. Uh, but one about the monsoon, we found that the current monsoon uh, actually happened somewhere around 3.2 to 2.8 million years ago. That means in the mid Pliocene time, uh, where the climate was more or less similar as today. And uh, the current strength is just built up around 1 million years ago. So this is the kind of work. And now, so this is very important for us to understand that how the monsoon is likely to behave in future. And this is one like this, we are doing several experiments about the paleo 
last 2000 years, what was the situation last 10,000 years. So we know that how the monsoon has behaved in the past and we would be able to forecast a similar way in the future. Now, our current forecast for next 100 years or so uh, for the monsoon, that what we think is that the decrease in the light rain and increase in the heavy precipitation. Many of you might have experienced this, that the rainfall events have decreased, but whenever rain comes, it is very heavy or extreme heavy, leading to floods and all, while the light and moderate events have decreased. Now, this has a lot of implications uh, on the groundwater. I mean, it's a one, uh, the groundwater, what happens is that the, if the shallow groundwater table, we are not talking about the deep one, uh, this will get affected. And this is the most important because this, the shallow groundwater table sustains the terrestrial ecosystem and the base flow in the rivers. So when you have this kind of a change in the rainfall pattern, we are likely to see changes in the river flow, base flow pattern, as well as the changes in the terrestrial vegetation, natural terrestrial vegetation. So this is a very important. And that is why what we propose is, because of these changes are likely to happen, we need what we call as a water census. We need a complete accounting of a spatial and temporal availability of a fresh water, at both in quantity and quality, at different levels, so that we can allocate the water both for the human needs and the ecosystem needs. I think this is very critical for us that this kind of changes, we need to make plans for doing this. And if you see like in um, Indus Basin, if we take an example, <laughs> The Indus Basin gets most of the water because of the snow melt, and which is also likely to change. And how this is going to change with the change in the snow cover and the ice melt, and how this, whether we can model this and can give forecast, because there are some forecasts which says that the Indus Basin likely to get about 10 to 20% less river uh, water flow in coming years. Now that is quite large. and. Uh, this can, our food, not only India, but even Pakistan food, uh, depends on the Indus Basin. So this could have a large implication. So this is kind of uh, studies which we need to further do it. The other major focus which we have now on the blue economy, looking at the future, especially after 2030, uh, we would be depending more and more on the ocean and uh, the government of India is very keen and they have announced uh, on the blue economy policy, the portion mission and many such things, Sagar Mala and all that to take advantage of this. There are a few examples that I will show you on this. The first is the fishery. Now we have, uh, India is one of the few countries in the world which has uh, advisory for fishermen and we are providing them that where to go and fish. Now, we also do this with a very clear understanding that it should not become overfishing. So if you see that our fishing is about 3.8 million tons and the potential is about 5.1 million tons. And most of the time we fish within the sustainable limits. So we are, this is the way we do more efficient fishing, not the overfishing. And this services for last 20 years we have been providing and of almost 100,000 fishers, I mean the mechanized uh, boat owners, uh, they use very regularly. And because of this, based on their experience, what they say is the 80% is a success rate. The search time is reduced by 60 to 70%. And that is why the fuel cost also has gone down an increase in catch is about two to four times. And the annual additional income which they get is about 70,800 rupees per trip. And this is done by National Council of Applied Economic Research. So it's a huge benefit coming to the individual fishermen. Also their social life because the time they spent on searching is reduced. So they are spending more time with their family what they used to do earlier. So. This is another very important service at the grassroots level which is being provided. 
we also do that what is we are now trying to understand like what we gave a forecast for wheat and rice and many other crops that this is likely to be a production so we are now trying to understand based on the different processes physical chemical and biological processes as seen from the chlorophyll temperature and etc that what is the likely stock of a fishery in a given season and this work is being now being done and shortly we would be able to provide that this year the likely potential of a fish is this much and then we can plan the catch catching strategy accordingly so this is another very important work as a research level which will ultimately uh, will come as a part of a routine services now this is uh, most of our fishery is uh, near uh, coast i mean they don't go beyond 50 100 meter depth so we have been now trying to find out what are the resources in the deep ocean beyond 200 up to 2000 meters and this is a huge resource available about 3.3 million tons and there are new grounds have been found of the various fish uh, chimera and the shark and many others there is another uh, victrophid fish which is non table fish but can be used for a uh, other uh, brackish water aquaculture feed and many other things is almost 100 billion tons. So huge resource is there, but we need to build a technology for harvesting and processing and of course uh, providing to the market. So this is an area which is, needs a further uh, work to be done, but we have a huge resource. So there is no issue that we are not going to have a fish in the future or something like that. Huge resource is there and we need to learn how to harness that. Also the marine biotechnological like ornamental fish. Uh, this uh, up till now most of the ornamental fish which many people have in the house is all important. Now we have in Luxweep we have a women's cooperative society built up to and this technology has been mastered and transferred to them the cooperative societies and that is being bought by one group of, of the Tata. So the entire chain has now been made and this is uh, very important uh, and this needs to be further you know done in many islands in the Lakshweep and Andaman, Nicobar and many others. Also we have now built a technology to rear fish in the cages. So you put a large cage about nine meter dia, a three meter dia cage into a sea and you rear fish that and this is, has been also very successful for cobia and the milk fish and this fish uh, we have to keep them about 10 to 11 months and uh, they can grow to a very large up to 4 kg uh, cobia and milk fish up to 700 grams so huge uh, resource this can give about 1 to 1 1.5 lakh rupees income to fishermen if they have a tree so this is another area which is being now uh, promoted at the same time we also need to understand the complete biodiversity and we have extremely good biodiversity what we call as a census of marine life we have three degree by three degree the grid and we measure uh, try to find out all kinds of life from microbes to well right from the surface to the seabed and this is india is now considered as a main center where this data is being uh, stored, which is called Ocean Biogeographical Information System. And there is a lot of support from the Indian Ocean Rim countries as well. But as you can see that the most of the data is available is around India and what India has been collecting. So this is very important and this we need to, like what we do our population census every 10 years, here also we need to do every 10 years to find out how the climate as affecting the biodiversity. So this is a very large project and which is being need to continuously do every 10 years. For the coastal and other areas. Also, we should not depend only, there is a huge amount of resource of 
Antarctica krill. And this has now been included in deep ocean mission. Uh, the krill is extremely good source of omega-3. And uh, India has uh, a share to fish in Antarctic waters. Currently, we are not doing, but it needs a different technology and processing and, and all that. And the huge resource of krill is there. We know where the krills are, and uh, it is only a question of time that we build a technology and the vessel and this uh, to harness this. So this is an area which we need to focus for the future. Similarly, the minerals in oceans is also equally critical. And uh, the large survey has to be done. India has done a tremendous amount of survey, about 31,000 line kilometers survey of seismic, gravity, magnetic, bathymetry. So we have extremely good database available. Also, uh, the polymatic nodules. Now we have a first mining site has been already found, uh, which has the manganese, copper, nickel, cobalt, etc. in Central Indian Ocean. And the total value is about 187 billion. And we have learned all the beneficiation, everything. Only the mining equipments are also now made. And it may take some time whether to decide whether to do mine or not after some time. Similarly, polymetallic nodules, uh, sulfides, also in the ocean, we have been now exploring that. We have found the vents, which is essentially as high lead zinc, but also gold and silver. So this is another area which we are doing. The third is the cobalt. We know where the cobalt crusts are available, which is very critical metal going to be in near in this future. And uh, we have to now get the exploration right for this. And uh, next uh, we can go for the mining. But this cobalt is going to be very critical in coming because all the becoming electronics and digital, I think cobalt is one area which we need to focus on. Also the gas hydrates. The India doesn't have much petroleum, but as a huge resource of a gas hydrate, that is a methane, a solidified methane, which could be even 10% if we can recover, uh, it could last for 100 years. So it's a huge resource. There is a lot of uh, work is being done uh, by NGRI, NIOT, NIO, also uh, the ONGC. ONGC has uh, drilled two major drilling operations in Manadi and proven that this is a major resource is available. But the problem is that the harnessing technology, we have to harness, if you normal harnessing, it is under pressure. So if you just bring it up, it will escape as a gas. So we need to build a technology to bring it as it is from the bottom to the top and then can be used. So, but I'm sure that in coming years, we would be able to master this technology as well. These are some of the technology which India has already built, which all this, like a soil tester, we can test the seabed at 6,000 meters. Completely all mechanical properties of the soil can be found. This is a, a remotely operable vehicle, which has a payload capacity of 150. You can put whatever sensors or it has a robotic arm. You can collect samples. These also can go up to 6,000 meters. This is a coring which can take a 100 meter core at 3000 meter depth. So this is also available. And the mining crawler uh, for mining the manganese nodule, this prototype is also ready, which can do the mining of the module. So India has been quite forefront in developing this uh, technology, but this has to be now translated into a industry so that they can make uh, more and more. And recently, the government of India has also announced a manned submersible. The details of this has been now worked out. And the I understand in a couple of years, we would be able to launch where one pilot and two scientists, crew members can go right up to 6,000 meters to learn about the various aspects of the, uh, the sea at that depth. Now, when you do a lot of work into the sea, what is more important also to provide the, how the coast, coastal state is behaving. So what we provide the information on the waves, currents, mixed layer waves, sea surface temperature, 
And this is being done at a different level, right from global level to Indian Ocean, to Bay of Bengal, to Arabian Sea, and right up to the port level. So complete uh, system right from the port level to the global level, the forecast is provided three to six hourly every day for next five days. So this is a huge uh, advantage. And there are more than um, seven lakh uh, users of this service every day. Also, the sea level rise and we are going to face more and more uh, erosion. This is the one case uh, in Pondicherry Beach. Those who have been going just opposite to uh, the Secretariat, the beach completely lost. And uh, we were asked whether we can do something on this. And uh, we have used uh, another technology, what we call as an underwater reef. And uh, this reef has been deployed and with artificial nourishment and all. And you can see that the beach has come back. And uh, this has a lot of societal importance in Pondicherry. People were so upset when they lost the beach. And uh, when this beach has come, I still get mails from a lot of people that we are so happy to get this beach back. So and this is done in such a way that from outside, nothing is seen. So the aesthetic value of the beach is also maintained. Similarly, we have also done a, a high new beaches, what we call as a blue flag beaches. It's a beaches which can have a definite quality, safety, everything is done. This is again in Pondicherry, Eden Beach. And uh, people are very happy because all the facility of uh, washroom, toilets, the other lockers, everything is there. So people can come and really enjoy. So this is another way we can provide the benefit to the people. The energy, renewable energy, the lot of work has been done on um, offshore wind, but this is little bit away because for offshore wind, you also need a good port the infrastructure where the custom built vessel, because you are going to deploy a turbine, which is of quite large, you know, the tower itself may be 100, 150 meter high. It's almost uh, like a field tower. So you need a quite different infrastructure to do that. Otherwise, this can be done, you know, but we need to move forward in this. Also, we realize that the all the data which we have collected is been now put as a digital ocean, what we call. And this is available to anyone as a line or a, as a area or a cross section. So visualization of the information of variety of parameters is now possible. So this is now uh, has been implemented. Also deep ocean mission I mentioned. And lastly, few things on the snow and glaciers. Uh, the Himalaya also we consider as a third pole. And uh, what we have found is that the loss is about 16 to 17% on the Indian side. And we also found that the Chinese side also, the loss of glaciers is about 16 to 17%. So our data is quite robust and we found that this is what is happening. We also found that the glaciers in Western Himalayas are retreating slowly, while in Eastern Himalayas they're retreating much faster. Now this has a lot of implications. And we found that by 21, I mean, after 80 years or so, we may lose from 10 to 30% of our um, glacier if the different emission, uh, low emission or a high emission, if we use. So we are going to lose large amount of glaciers, uh, even if the emission is controlled for the next 100 years. Now, what we found is that the total loss of the ice which is happening in entire Himalaya, that means including Tibet, is about 4 billion tons. Now, this is a huge mass which is going away. And I mentioned earlier, now, this kind of a mass, when you taken out from a surface, what we call as an isostatic rebound, there would be a, some rebound, something else will happen. And this is not studied. So, we 
suggests that we need to study the deformation which is likely to about the glacio-eustatic changes which are occurring. We need to study this. And I have a hunch that some of the fractures which is now developed in Rishiganga could be, could be because of this isostatic adjustment. But we have not done much work on this. And I think we need to focus on these aspects that if you remove so much ice, what is going to happen? And to study this, uh, we have put a station in Chandra Basin called Himansh. And uh, this continuously measures around the year. You can stay there for up to six months. There is a facility. And all the measurements, all the geological, geophysical, hydrological, meteorological observations are made. And we are trying to build a model for this uh, cryosphere. And now such kind of system we need to do in many more places. One place is not enough. We need to build our system for most of the basins that what is happening there. At the same time in Arctic, uh, many people asked me a question that when we started work in Arctic in 2007 and 8, that why Arctic? And uh, the main thing is that there is a lot of connection, teleconnection between Arctic and uh, India has now put a multi-center Moore Observatory uh, with the support of Norway in year uh, long year B. And uh, this is provided data for many years now. And this is, we are trying to understand that how the Arctic processes are changing with the changes in the climate and ultimately what its impact on the Indian monsoon. So this is the one major study which we have been doing. And uh, the reason the uh, why, there are one thing which we found is that the even heavy rainfall events in Northwest uh, Himalaya, what happened in Kashmir floods or Pakistan floods or Kedarnath. Uh, at that time, we found that there is a melting also increase in the Canadian Arctic. And now I think we are going to, we have set up a station in Canadian Arctic as well. So there is a lot of connection between Arctic and we need station one we have in Norway, but I think we need in uh, not only in Canada, but also in Greenland and Alaska to understand what is happening in the Arctic. Also, we need to set up satellite receiving stations in Arctic, like what we have done in Antarctica, so that we get the about 10 to 12 satellite orbit data in a real time. From Hyderabad, we are getting only three or four orbit, which is not enough. So we need a global data. So we need to have a stations in this. Also, the other why we should be in Arctic is exploration of oil and gas. Though many people say that it may not be, but I have a feeling that even, even if we have the best, uh, we won't be able to use more than 50% of our requirement from renewable energy. Other 50% has to come from the fossil fuel. And we need to continue to have our say in Arctic oil and gas. Also, the critical matters, the rare earth, especially niobium. If we are going to work for the renewable, the most important is the battery and the permanent magnet. And without niobium, you cannot have, either you have to depend on somebody else. And what we are seeing now, that uh, in chips, we said we will buy chips who can build uh, cheaper than us. And we are now suddenly don't know what to do. Similar thing may happen for rare earth. We don't have, we need to focus our attention on rare earth and wherever rare earths available, I think we need to secure the mining rights. I'm sure if we want in Greenland, it should be possible, maybe Chile, it may be possible. But this is an area I think we need to focus looking at some of the rare earth other than the economic mineral angle. Rare earth is going to be very critical in the coming years for the, when we depend more and more on the green mobility. New shipping routes, uh, this is also very important for India because shipping routes is going to create a lot of issues. Also the uh, other, uh, and we need to take this as a, our contribution to the global. So we need to participate in international forum and all. Dr. Arvind Gupta knows very well, he has been a great supporter of uh, Arctic. So, I would like to thank him for his support for all the work which we did in Arctic. Also the Antarctic. 
I think the Antarctica currently, of course, is the significance, most geopolitical significance, but we are currently focusing on the science and uh, like understanding the weather, climate, uh, how the India separated from the Antarctica and came, biodiversity, potential drugs. So a lot of work which we have been doing. You can see very modern station which we built in 2012, uh, 10 years before the party has been providing. Now, but what is going to happen by 2040 that the current Antarctic Treaty is going to end. And we have to be ready to stake our claim. And if our presence is not there, I think we won't be able to stake claim. So our presence in Antarctica is very critical. We need to increase our activity in Antarctica. We have already two stations and probably we can have a couple of more because this is a very long-term investment which we are going to make. And at the same time, by that, the ice is also going to melt over the Antarctica as well. Even today, even if you want, you can't uh, get, but ice will melt. And at that particular time, I'm not sure that the countries will say that, no, no, we will keep it as it is. See, even US and Russia has not signed the treaty. So it is not that the all superpower, and we have seen how the China has been uh, treating the international accords, they don't care. So I think our presence in Antarctica is very critical. Now, lastly, I just want to say that the, the one which we are generating is the Earth system knowledge, but it is not enough. We need a social system which is essentially deals with the infrastructure, governance and the policy and the human system, which is also a behavior. I think this, the knowledge which we have should translate into a policy for the governance and accordingly we need to build the infrastructure. And similarly with that also the human system also we need to build which needs the kind of people which we need to do and understand the various impacts. So we need to build all the three. We Building alone knowledge is not going to help. We need to build both the social and the human system to take the advantage of the knowledge. And I'm extremely grateful to all my colleagues. I can't uh, individually thank them, but all the people in these all institutes of uh, Earth System Science and Council of Scientific Industrial Research, I'm extremely grateful to them for they all participated in variety of this activity and help us to build a system which not only did a best science, but also provided the best services to the people and not only to the India, but the entire uh, Indian Ocean communities. And thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Naik, for uh, what a fascinating uh, overview of uh, the earth sciences uh, systems in India, how we are studying them that you have given to us. And uh, a lot of it is uh, to us uh, very new information and uh, very useful information. And I think it will set uh, many of us thinking, uh, how is it that uh, we don't know about uh, uh, this uh, so often uh, it's not talked about. Uh, despite the fact that uh, your work uh, impinges and touches upon every uh, uh, person in the country uh, through weather forecasting, to tsunami forecasting, fisheries, and so many other areas uh, that you have mentioned. So uh, quite clearly, you have been uh, working, uh, all your colleagues and all these about more than a dozen institutions that you listed, working uh, quietly. Uh, and uh, very effectively, and I must say very modestly. Uh, this is, of course, the ha hallmark of uh, great work uh, that uh, the scientists are uh, doing. And you mentioned, I think, your budget, uh, if I could get it uh, right, about 2,000 crores, whereas just one activity is generating a benefit of 10,000 crores. So if you put everything together, perhaps uh, the... Uh, 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 the return is maybe 100 times than the budget that you are. Uh, uh, and yet, 
the sorry state of affairs is that uh, none of this uh, is uh, discussed and all that we discuss is that if the monsoon is delayed by a week then there is oh our forecasting kitna kharab hai and all that. <laughs> yeah. but that is anyway the uh, nature of the uh, game but uh, i think as indians we can be proud that uh, so much wonderful work uh, in just about uh, 2000 crores which is not even a change uh, for uh, most of the ministries uh, that uh, you are doing so uh, but i think the importance of your talk is that uh, we are uh, truly uh, well informed today better informed uh, than earlier and uh, just the sheer uh, uh, breadth of areas that uh, you are covering from the portions to the heights of the himalayas from deep inside the earth the earthquakes uh, to uh, remote sensing and remotest of the places like the arctic and the antarctic and in the uh, central indian ocean your people are there your ships are there your boys are there your sensors are there and uh, all of this is coming together as an organic whole in an interdependent uh, multidisciplinary approach and how is it that we don't know about this so i hope uh, <laughs> this remote talk uh, will contribute to raising that awareness but uh, 